Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And a welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. We've got our freshly printed State of the Union bingo cards and <laughs> drinking game rules getting ready to go for tonight's State of the Union address. Uh, it's also officially the start of the fourth quarter of the Obama administration, two years from well, right about now, there'll be a new president, and uh, hopefully it uh, won't be anyone who voted for this one. Uh, Jim, let's start with the good martini today. There's obviously a lot of frustration on the right, and duly so, as we talked about it last week, about what seems to be the Republicans' inability, most likely uh, in the coming weeks here, to actually stop the president from doing his uh, unilateral amnesty for about $5 million Adults illegally in this country whose kids have some sort of legal status. They are going to try and push, of course, the House bill through the Senate. It's unlikely to get the 60 votes needed. And even if it does, the president will veto it. So that's not looking good. But the Republicans are finding a way to go after some other things that a lot of people are frustrated about. And that's the president's aggressive regulatory agenda. This story from The Hill. Republicans believe they have identified a potent weapon in their fight against President Obama's regulatory agenda. Lawmakers plan to employ the seldom-used Congressional Review Act, which gives lawmakers the power to formally disapprove of major agency rules as they seek to ratchet up their attacks on federal red tape. Uh, Bob Goodlatte, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, has said, well, we couldn't really use this before because it was divided in the majority between uh, Republicans in the House and Democrats in the Senate, so this didn't make any sense. Now we can do it since we control both sides of Capitol Hill. Uh, The weird part is it's got a 60-day window, essentially, for lawmakers to uh, try and bring specific regulations to the floor to overturn. The bad news is that if you do pass legislation to overturn them, the president can still veto that legislation. So, Jim, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, all these onerous EPA regulations and some of these other things – are are going to necessarily vanish before our eyes, but at least it shows that the Republicans are fighting for ways to uh, stop this president from getting uh, more and more aggressive and many would argue more and more lawless. If nothing else, this is a useful kind of rhetorical tool for members of Congress to say, look, we explicitly passed a law saying you can't do this and you're turning around and doing this. And I think this will merely heighten the sense that this is a lawless president It'll be interesting to see, you know, when they when they vote on these things, whether there's a bipartisan agreement that these regulations should not go forward. At some point, one of the things that that has to be part of the 2016 discussion, both for the Republicans and the country as a whole, is that we elected a rogue president who who basically doesn't believe he has to work with Congress at all, uh, believes that he really has power of the purse and that he really makes all the major decisions for for government. It's not what the founders intended. It's not the way it's supposed to system is supposed to be set up. It's not really clear how you would differentiate this from a dictatorship, that all power residing in the executive. And uh, so hopefully this will be a useful tool to illustrate uh, runaway regulations and uh, people in the executive branch believing that they don't have to do anything. They don't have to check with Congress at all for the running of the government. Jim, uh, whether it's a lack of good civics education anymore in, in our younger generations or just the intense partisanship right now, do you get the sense that Most Americans care if it's done constitutionally anymore as long as they get done what they want to see get done. Oh, look, I don't care how it happens. I just want I want what I want and I want it now. Right. Is a very dangerous philosophy. And I would point out like there are there are times I wonder if some folks on the right um, think through these things that, that there's a difference between a conservative and a right wing radical. They both may be looking towards the same policy goal, but the conservative cares about how he gets there as well as, you know, the actual goal itself. We are dealing with a Darth of about 30 years worth of lack of constitutional education in this country, and we've got to explain to people why this matters and why the rules are in place to protect everybody, not just one side. Yeah, that's a challenge in and of itself, much less the policy debates. All right, on to the bad martini now, and we alluded to it at the start. Tonight is State of the Union night. Uh, we're now in the seventh year of the Obama administration. For the most part, all the uh, jewels in this speech, as far as we know, have kind of been uh, tipped off to the media. We've got the tax increase plan on uh, capital gains and fees for the banks and free, quote unquote, things like uh, community college, which we explained yesterday is not all that free, and other ways that the president will once again try to drive wedges, most especially it looks like uh, between classes in, in this country tonight, Jim. So 
outside of the drinking games and the bingo cards, uh, it, as you pointed out in the jolt today, it's something that folks inside the Beltway care about and pay attention to a whole lot more than those outside. Yeah, I mean, I, as I put it in the jolt today, Greg, if I didn't have to do this, if I wasn't professionally obligated to watch this, <laughs> I'd be watching ESPN or something. Um, and we all know that's what the president prefers to do <laughs> right. compared to the news. The fact that he keeps previewing the stuff in it makes it even more anticlimactic. My understanding is the shortest State of the Union address from the president so far has been an hour. The longest has been an hour and a half. We know this thing is going to go on. We know he wants to push the Republican response as late into the evening as possible. Joni Ernst seems like a, a really swell new senator, but I'm not really, you know, like basically for millions of Americans, this is just preempting primetime television. Um, and it's a very predictable speech. It's a whole bunch of ideas that are never going to get enacted through a Republican Congress. So they are effectively kind of a waste of time. And, um, you know, like if you it's like, if you really want to extend an olive branch, then maybe it'd be something kind of interesting here. It'd be interesting to see, you know, what would go on. Instead, it's going to be the usual demagoguery. We saw him denouncing the Supreme Court to their faces in a circumstance that uh, uh, where they really couldn't speak back. That's kind of the Obama sucker punch uh, approach to these sorts of things. That's, you know, I, I, you know, it's been six years, Greg, and I think we're, we're just tired of this guy. The whole thing is kabuki theater under the best of circumstances. A lame duck president going out and, and doing the same old thing over and over again is, is just going to be even more infuriating to watch and, you know, even more pointless than usual. Well, let's hope we get some good expressions from Joe Biden and John Boehner behind the president and uh, yeah. keep us slightly entertained. Uh, Maybe they'll bring a flask. <laughs> Do their own little drinking game. Yeah, that'd be that. That should be how president, how, you know, <laughs> this whole talk, we're not going to invite the guy or they're going to turn their backs like the NYPD. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, with the exception of any, any members who have a rule again. Actually, they can, you know, they can bring apple cider or something, but just everybody has a pocket flask. <laughs> and then every time Obama does something in the drinking game, they just all simultaneously take a drink. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fantastic, Greg? We just got a way to make it much more interesting tonight. Yes, I hope somebody on Capitol Hill is listening to this because this could be a uh, great new tradition. Okay, on to the uh, crazy martini now. And this is one that's obviously gotten a lot of attention over the past 48 hours or more. And that is in in reaction to the phenomenal success in the opening weekend of American Sniper. It's the story of Sniper Chris Kyle. Clint Eastwood directs the movie. And the big controversy, of course, in recent days has been the comments via social media from Michael Moore, who said because his uncle was uh, killed by a Nazi sniper in World War II that all snipers are cowards. And then Seth Rogen compared uh, the American sniper to the movie that Hitler was uh, watching in the later scene of uh, Inglorious Bastards, the Tarantino movie from a number of years ago. Jim, obviously a lot of blowback directed towards these two guys and uh, most of it rightfully so. <clears throat> yeah, I wrote it later on. I said, look, I just said it reminded me of it. I wasn't comparing the two. <laughs> OK, you know, maybe he's still going through a tough time after the, you know, <laughs> North Korean hack and things like that. So I'll focus it more on Michael Moore. And and I look, I'm as guilty of this as much as the next guy, because I wrote about it in today's Morning Jolt. When Michael Moore comes out and says, ah, snipers are the bad guys. They're cow- uh, uh, no, give me a snack. Um, <laughs> when he does that. He's clearly like crying for attention. This is trolling. This because as, as I look back and I looked and I mentioned Michael Moore twice in the morning jolt in like the last six months. Like most of us can go really long stretches without ever thinking about Michael Moore or even using his name in a sentence unless it's, hey, you know, you really got to you got to cut back on the donuts. You're starting to look like Michael Moore. And, you know, so by doing this, everybody in conservative world feels the need to say, how dare you say that? What the hell's wrong with you? You're you know, you're a terrible person. And clearly, Michael Moore feeds off of this. Clearly, this you know, our denunciation, our criticism doesn't frighten him or, or bother him at all. Um, I also can't help but suspect there's quite a bit of professional jealousy they're going out through here. Because, look, uh, Clint Eastwood is obviously all one of the all-time greats. Uh, Greg, you remember when he, when he gave his speech at the RNC and that was considered, uh, <laughs> well, that's the end of Clint's career. You know, yeah. It's time to put him out to pasture and all that stuff. And instead, he just makes what is obviously the biggest opening uh, film of his career. I noticed he didn't get a Best Director nod, but I think you got to figure serious contender for Best Picture and, and Bradley Cooper for Best Actor. This kind of a reaction and obviously very good word of mouth. I haven't seen it myself, so I'm going to hold back on, on making a full comment there. But most of the people who see this movie are, are saying it moved them to tears. Extremely powerful in a lot of ways, the movie they've been waiting for, telling about 
the experience of, of American soldiers post 9-11, the good and the bad, the pain and the love and, and all that stuff. And that's, that's hitting a chord. This is gonna, probably going to be remembered as one of the all-time greats. And I don't know that Seth Rogen or, or Michael Moore will ever be remembered for anything like that. And you've got to figure at some point that really eats at them. And it's kind of really it's a very different change of pace for something to be eating Michael Moore instead of the other way around. <laughs> oh, excellent exit. Jim, enjoy the State of the Union. And I put enjoy in quotation marks and we'll talk again tomorrow. I'm bored already, Greg. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And be sure to tune in on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.